Okay, so you've listened to my soapbox. Okay, so other things people know about the GOEs and the source of your information. I know that they are on the six canonical areas. And how do you know that? Um, I'm not really sure from people. That's a fair answer. Yeah. Uh, a way to answer the questions can be found in the questions themselves. And how do you know that? Where Category. did you? Category. Okay. Um, I was found it interesting that those who grade it, they have to get like 80% agreement or something on it, or else they get kicked off the board to make it consistent with grading. So how do you know that? Um, from someone on who made the question. Okay. So from a personal source. Okay. Everybody else, what do you know, and how do you know it? You know things, even if it's just like rumors, you know things. So if you've already shared, no, go. Everybody else, everybody gets to do this once. It's clerical hazing. How do you know that? <laughs> okay, it's good, okay. <laughs> clerical hazing, his bishop told him. Okay. Do we, do we, uh, well, okay. Well, I'm gonna hold off. Everybody else has, yep, we've got some people that, yeah. Well, um, to that point, some bishops care extra about it and others don't <coughs> And how do you know that? For, uh, come down and sit in one of the rows that already has a person in it. Some um, previous seminarians that graduated with the GOEs and talked okay. about whether or not the bishops cared yeah. or made them take their role mm -hmm. or whatever. I know my bishop did poorly on the GOEs. <laughs> you know that probably from him, right? He told me. Because yeah. he's the only one that can tell you that. Uh, yep. I know I don't have to pass it to be ordained. Okay. And you know that from? My bishop. Okay. That they're graded proficient and not proficient. Right. And how do you know that? The word of mouth. I don't remember. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So everybody who is in the room is sharing one thing they know about the GOEs and the source of their information, even if it's just rumor. Who hasn't shared? One thing you know about the GOEs and your source of your information. That VTS, uh, middlers of VTS help people who are doing the best. They, they, the exams in some way. I don't know how, but specifically by VTS. Okay. Yep, and what do you know? I know that VTS generally does fairly well based on the statistics. How do you know that? From where, who do you know that? The Board of Examining Chaplains website. If you look the at last year's statistics, I'm not sure you would find that to be true. No, I was being generous. I was <laughs> That's what I was gonna ask. <laughs> what does fairly well mean in someone's? So you can find how every school has done mm -hmm. and how regional schools are done. Um, you know, demographic summaries are up on the Board of Examining Chaplains website. So, um, I know we have at least two people in here who have taken, oh, here we're gonna put Elizabeth Malpers on the spot right as she walks in the door. Elizabeth Malpers, what is one thing you know about the GOEs and what is the source of your information? Um, I've been to the Board of Examining Chaplains website and, and um, looked at the information there. Okay, good. Um, we're gonna look at some stuff from their website today too. Um, I know we have at least two people in this room who have taken bar, the bar exam. Anybody else taken a professional certification exam? Okay? So it's fascinating to me that in ministry, we will honor other professional certification exams, and yet we'll talk about the GOEs as hazing. Do we also believe that all those other professional certification exams were hazing? Okay. Yes. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, be accurate. I don't really have an either way but I want to make sure that you're aligning your your opinion about the GOEs with your opinion about other exams does that does that make sense that that's what they are is they are according to the church the Episcopal Church a set of boards I think it is helpful professionally to think about them that way they are not the strictest of any mainline denomination the Presbyterian churches are much stricter um, Presbyterian seminarians start taking them in their middle year because you cannot be ordained until you have passed all of them. That is a national standard and local bishops and local adjudicatories do not have a an option to um, do anything different. Okay? So several years ago, there became a great controversy and a great rumor out there about how many dioceses really use the GOEs. 
So percentage-wise of the diocese in the Episcopal Church, how many do you think actually have their seminarians take the GOEs? 80. Huh? 80. <coughs> it's most. It's like over 90 still. So um, some of the concerns that developed about the GOEs were about how they were being graded and how they were being assessed. That has changed completely in the last five years. So I would say that anyone who gives you information about GOEs, if their information is over five years old, then listen for what it might say to you spiritually, how it might be a personal encouragement to you, but take what they say about the actual exam or how it is assessed with a grain of salt. Because it would be like me comparing my ACT experience 30 years ago to someone who took the ACT now. The formula and the structure of the exam has changed so much and has been redesigned to such an extent that it's not, it's apples and oranges. So, so part of my theory about exams is that content is secondary. Understanding the exam is most important. So um, I, have a, I have a piece of paper here that's directly off the Board of Examining Chaplains website. This is a terrible website. It's poorly laid out. It's boring. They know all that. You can pass these back. Um, but the information there is really good, okay? So the information there is really good. So pass these out. And um, I want you to look at this. And um, you have about two minutes to look at this, circle something, note something on this that is important for you to know about the exam now, and know that your source of information is accurate. Same way that you're all going to share resources, let's continue to do some communal learning. What are so? What are some? What do you notice here? What are the things you were like? Say, oh, I want to bring this to the top of my attention. Uh, I was intrigued by the comment that uh, they're asking for some something relevant to the church today. 
and I'm not quite sure. I, I can see how in some questions that would apply, but some maybe not. I, I'd be interested to see what that means. Okay. <coughs> so most of your questions are going to ask for some application piece and relevancy. <laughs> They're going to ask you to think about how you would answer this question um, in relationship to events happening today or in a way that is not just a historical encyclopedic entry. So most of the questions will prompt that. Okay. It, it, will that typically come about in, in a specific, you know, apply this to this specific situation and then give that or apply it to the church today? It's sort of this big It can wow. happen either way. Okay. It could happen either way. And we're gonna look at some questions together. So we'll get a chance to look at some of that. Okay? It's a great question though, it can happen either way. <coughs> Other things you pointed you noticed here. Yes. I'm surprised that it says personal witness is welcome and is sometimes requested. But then it does say, but it's not a substitute for soft answer. Right. So nobody else should be able to write your answers. Do you mean so like you because I know you and we know each other, I'm going to use an example. If there is a question about the relationship between the Episcopal Church and the Roman Catholic Church and how you might interact with that, I would expect that to come out that you have a wife who's, do you mean like that you live that question in your family? Do you mean like that's a fine thing to come in? That's how you would answer that pastorally. They are not expecting you to write encyclopedic entries. I mean, I, we don't know each other well, but we've gotten started to get to know each other a little bit. I would expect it to come out that as someone who will serve the church in Cuba. Do you mean, or at least part of your probably priesthood will be serving and working with relationships there. That could come out. If you are someone who will be ordained and serve or you have been greatly formed in the South, where being in relationship with and conversation with evangelicals is a significant part of your life, that, that's okay for that to come out. That's personal witness. That's what makes you the fact that you are interacting with this academic material in a way very important. But it's not personal witness just to the point of saying, as somebody who's lived this, I know all of this. No, as this, this is informing my conversation with the content. Do you get the difference between those two things? The difference between personally informed writing versus testimony. Other observations and things here. Yeah. Uh, I was surprised about the possibility to say English is not my first language. Right, yes. Which is a, uh, something that is stressing me out because I have to tell not only with the text but only with the language. And you should tell your writers that. You should tell your readers that. It's fine for them to know that. And you can decide how you tell them that. You can say, as someone who will serve you know, the church in Cuba, you, like you could decide. Do you come out straight out and say English is my, isn't my first language or do you tell them your context and there that leads to that. You can decide that piece, okay? Other things that are on this page that people thought were important? Mm -hmm. The thousand word limit, I mean it's technical, but it's... It's important, you guys. You write too much, and they're gonna, I mean, so. Um, let's be honest, they're not gonna cut you off if you're at 1,050, 1,100 you know, 1100, but if you keep writing and you don't go back and come back, then they are going to start, you know, being like, oh, okay, well, we're going to read the first thousand words. I don't actually know exactly what their policy is. I know they vary that year to year, and I don't, I haven't heard this year's, but. Mm -hmm. it, there's a comment in here about don't, uh, not overdoing quotations, which leads me to ask, how often do you cite sources as so you want to cite sources, but don't overdo quotations. So remember, you could use, so lots of theologians love language. Theologians love to say things long and complicated. So do you put that entire quote in there that takes up 200 words, or do you say, uh, you, know, you know, Bart's understanding of the Trinity, which is, and 10 words to summarize that big comment, and then you put, you know, your citation in parentheses at the end. But they do want to see references to sources. Yes, that hole down at the bottom, absolutely. You, you know, oh, you cite that. your sources, whether consulted or directly or quoted. If you are, if you are basing something off something that Kathy Grieb said in a course lecture, you put Grieb, course lecture. I mean, like it says that right here, class notes. I mean, they want you to know that. They want you to use all these sites and these different things. Use context. 
Uh, quite place me in the first. Um, if we put the report on the citation and we put the full quote in there, does that count towards it or not? To your word count? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay, Which is why they don't want you to do a formal, bibliogra formal bibliography because that counts towards your word count. So what you're going to do is you're going to write these in Word and you're going to cut and paste them into the GOE thing. And in some years, I, I'm sorry, I should have looked, I should have called and found this out before I had this session with you today. I'll find it out and try to send you information. But you'll also get information when you sign up. Some years it's a hard thousand words, which means that the, the, um, the online program will take the first thousand words you cut and paste in. Give me. Some years it's a little more flexible and I don't know, it's been both ways, I don't know which way it is. But that's why they only want you to do parentheses for your citations, not full bibliographic entries. So on uh, Duncan Ellie's um, last year, his video, he said, you know, if it says a thousand words, we'll probably still read up to 1500, but, okay. um, and you should get at least 800. So, you know, he. Yeah. Okay. It, but th that doesn't mean that what you just said is null either. Right. It's just that, you know, they are serious <laughs> about that number. Yeah. And every year he's really clear about that. I just don't know what's been said for this year. Do you know what I mean? But you yeah. should check that out. You should know that before you go into the first day of the exam. Brooks, you had a question. Um, I thought it was interesting the one that um, everybody asks a question. We write it like that. So if they ask you the news or the newsletter, you don't just answer the question. <coughs> that's right. And that's how they get a lot of the, for practical church, for the church today. Their formats of the kinds of answers they ask for is some of that. Do you mean so you might get asked, how would you lay out or, you know, expose this history concept in an adult forum context or, you know, in a series of newsletter articles? You might get asked that question. That might be a piece of how you're asked to answer something. So, yeah, I think that's really important. If they encourage you to use list, use them. I mean, read the question. Um, the, the, the website have suggested uh, books of references to have on hand for these things? I don't believe so, no. But I don't know. You'll have to look at that and check that out. They change their sources there on a regular basis. So um, <coughs> part of the situation is everybody handles this differently. I mean, Episcopal Church, Episcopal seminaries are so different, and these questions are written to fit across the spectrum, that what would be go-to commentaries at VTS might not be the same go-to commentaries that you would have on hand if you were at CVSP or if you were at, you know, EDS at Union. So part of it is not about having a certain set of references, I mean, besides the prayer book and the, the um, you know, hymnal and our other sort of Episcopal pieces. Part of it is having the references that you go to most, I mean, what are your go-to references? So that's going to be different for different people, even in this room. I would, I mean, I would think so. Um, well. So I want to point. Anybody else have anybody else have other things on this page they want to point out? I have some things that I think are important. Review the GOEs, especially since 2016. I wouldn't read questions back before that. I mean, they're just going to get confusing and they're in different formats. So only look at the last three years. It's really been the last five years that they changed and made major shifts, but the last three have been really consistent. Um, um, when you get your login, once you're all set up, make sure you know how to log in and how this site works before the morning of your first exams. I mean, you'll get a login, you'll get a, it's a customized private login. The back end of the site is very sophisticated to protect data. Make sure you get in I mean, and all that. Um, have your notes and other, order, um, other resources organized at hand when answering questions. All questions are currently open resource. Um, when Lots of people will recommend that you don't just have your books out there, but that you have your notes. You might also want a concept map or a set of outlines in order to show the connections that you already know exist. I mean, so if you have um, a set of liturgy books, I mean, and you have four liturgy books in front of you, you might want to know at the beginning, oh, this person gives great history. This person has better application. Do you mean so that you might use those books in order? 
I mean, if you're pulling stuff from Hannah Mattis's church history um, course, I think it would actually be interesting and might be worth the time for this group to think about taking that some of those notes from that course and creating some concept <coughs> maps that you then shared with each other so that you could say, hey, what was happening in this time period? Do you I mean so that you might put one of the major councils in the center of the time period and say, oh, here are all the things that were happening around that. I mean, you could share some resources like that with each other if you wanted to collaboratively do that. But something so that when you quickly go, when you quickly get a question, how are you going to go to something and say, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You don't have a lot of time to do research. I mean, so you're going to your first two or three go-to items. Um, then manage your time so that you can organize, write, edit, and submit. If that submit piece. <laughs> I mean, so like whatever time, how you feel comfortable, set yourself a deadline, 10 or 15 minutes before it has to be submitted. And that's your hard deadline to be finished so that you have enough time to submit. If you write up until the deadline, you're not going to get it in on time. I mean, so I think one of the really important things for you to do is to think about for you, what is the right pattern of time in this block of time that you have? So some of us write in order to find our thoughts. Do you mean, and so for that person, the thing you may want to do is you may want to say my first 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to free write. Do you mean, and I'm just going to write to get my thoughts down. Then I'm going to, stop, I'm going to set a timer, then I'm going to go and I'm going to um, instead go and then I'm going to look at resources and then structure something and then go back and then I'm going to save so much time to edit. Others of us will want to go to resources right away. Do you mean, and so you might say, I'm going to sit in the first 15 minutes looking at resources and then I'm going to outline or structure it, then I'm going to write. Others may want to start to take and break apart the rubric and the question and create an outline. I'm going to encourage you all to do that at some point in your time. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Do you mean, and then go to resources to fill those pieces in and then go to write. Do you mean, whatever you know about how you do, create a rhythm because then we're a liturgical church. We probably wouldn't be in the Episcopal Church if you didn't like rhythm and liturgy to some extent. Create that for your time periods. I mean, and do a couple of, take a couple of the old questions and practice doing that in the right amount of time, a couple of times before the exam, so that you know does your rhythm work for you. Because sometimes we'll say, oh, this is how I should do it, and then we'll try it, and we're like, oh, that didn't work. I need to reverse these two steps. So like, if I, that would be one thing I would encourage you to do. Figure out what your pattern's gonna be. Um, so, and you know, use your, use whatever it is. You know you can turn off all your notifications on your phone and still and just use it as a timer. You can set timers on your computer, however you wanna do the timer, but use it. So that would be, I think that's one of the most important things to do is figure out how you are gonna use these blocks of time and test that out. Because then each one is a rhythm. I mean, and then each one you know what to come and you know what to expect. Um, questions about that? Okay. I assume at this point you guys will jump in and just holler and jump in when you have a question. Um, I think that's really important to think about this. You need to edit, but not in the way that you're trying to get stuck in editing. Do a quick read to make sure that you didn't leave out transitions. So often when we're writing really fast, we forget to explain why we think one point is connected to the next point. So when you edit, I would put up a sign in my space where I'm taking it that says transition sentences. Do you really, do, am I clear with my transition sentence? Because of X, therefore, do you mean, um, you know, whatever, how it is, those kinds of things. And then I would always reread my intro paragraph last and make sure that you have a strong thesis sentence that outlines what you're doing in your essay. 
based upon this historian's perspective, the church has come to understand our theology in this way. Therefore, in the 21st century Episcopal church, we blank. Do you mean like, like that's the, that is in some ways the kind of sentence you want at the end of your first intro paragraph because it tells them exactly, you know what? I hit every section of that question. I know it. And it tells them from the beginning, you read the question, you knew the parts of the question, and you have paid attention to all of them. Does that sort of make some sense? I typically do that at the end. That's my final read. Is my thesis clear? Or do I have transition sentences? Okay. Um, now this is really important, this next sentence. Answer the question asked rather than the question you wish had been asked. I have a theory about VTS students and essay <laughs> exams. I think that because at VTS, most of the time, we do not grade to a rubric. Very few, few of us grade to a rubric on a regular basis. I think that if you are a VTS student who's gotten really good at writing an essay that's a coherent, well thought out essay, you often get away with answering the question you wish had been asked instead of the question that is actually asked. I see some nod heads nodding. I, so when you do that and you grade <coughs> against a rubric, you fail. Or you're not proficient. Sorry, it's not called failure anymore. It's not proficient. <laughs> um, GOH used to be graded on a, a scale of one to five. And as long as you got a four or five, and the question was always, how many fives did you get? Like, that was like a secret when I was in seminary. Do you mean like how many? It was just like you would never hear about how many, you know, like how many fours did you get? How many fives did you get? Like even like my best friends, very best friends, like we went off campus and away, and like we're like off, way away before we told each other what we'd made. Um, it, so it used to be a much more complicated grading system. Now it's just proficient or um, not proficient. But um, but that's what happens. I mean, so so it also means that if you spend all your time on one section of the question, you're not going to be proficient. So that's the other thing you've got to really watch is. Make sure you give time. It is better to do each section of the question to 70% than to do 100 on one and skip one. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's a question in the back. I have a question about the meaning of proficient. Not yeah, proficient. okay. So is it uh, over 50% and no. under 50%? We're going to look at that in just a minute. Okay. I've got the definition right here yeah. for last year. Um, so that's just another thing I want you to think about is what was the question asked? I mean, and did you answer it? Okay, so look, I have the criteria. I have, we have about 20 minutes left. And so once again, I have something for you to, pa to pass out. This is um, the scale of general criteria. So take one of these and pass them back. This is last year's exam. Most of you probably have already looked at this. Maybe, maybe not. We're going to look at general criteria and then I'm going to assign you in groups to look at a particular question and tell us what you're seeing about the rubric. We're going to read rubrics together. Okay. Okay. So, the evaluators weigh GOE questions with the following in mind. Perception and analysis of issues application of resources, demonstration of knowledge, and articulation of views. What do you think the word perception and analysis of issues, what does that mean? What do we think that probably means? Understanding the question. Understanding the question. And the situation that's being put forth in the question. I mean, did you, what is your perception of the analysis? I mean, um, like, how did you perceive the issue? Do you perceive it to be about justice? Do you perceive it to be a theological issue? Is it a liturgy issue? There's multiple ways to do that, but what did, are you clear about your perception? If something is set up as a justice issue, like I, I have not, 
I can only be doing this session because I am not in conversation this year with people writing exams. In the past, I have consulted with a couple of subgroups writing exams. I'm not this year. Um, I would guess that there's a chance that we're gonna that you're gonna see something that applies something to immigration. I would guess you may see something about um, concerns about women, um, stat the status of women in the church and this and society. So what is your perception? If a question is set up to be a justice question and you deny that it, I mean, and they use that justice language in it and you don't go in that direction, that's your perception of the issue. I mean, so if they say something is this kind of situation, a particular challenge, you know, are you willing to go there? How do you see it? So are you clear? Um, application of resources. They don't want you to just cite things. You're going to say, based on my understanding of Moltmann, you know, therefore, it applies that. So you want you to apply the resources. So don't choose resources or citations that don't support, your, support something or you draw, lead you to draw a conclusion. Um, Stacy, yeah. along those lines, would it, would it be, is it appropriate to Cite a resource that you disagree with to show maybe both. The That'd same. be fabulous. Do you know what I mean like that's a great way to say it? Do you know I mean the Episcopal Church is, has a multiplicity yeah. of perspectives? Right. Both, you know, one perspective could be this, and the other perspective could be this. Because of A, B, and C, I align with that, which one? That make, that brings up another question. It's okay to use the personal voice as opposed to the academic uh, voice. Absolutely. Okay. Right. That's what they're sort of saying show up in this. Do you know I mean like I think that's the personal piece that they're trying to get to too. They are not going to grade you whether on whether they are not concerned whether you use an academic voice or a personal voice. Are concerned with whether you're answering the question and when we look at rubrics, whether you're hitting the pieces of the rubrics. But so make sure that your resources lead you to a conclusion or lead you to something. Whether it's a disagreement with a resource or an agreement with a resource. Either way, it's something. You're not summarizing. The goal of this exam is not to summarize the thinking on this topic. It is to use the thinking on this topic to illustrate and articulate your perspective, which is a different, you know, a different way and a different piece. So demonstration of knowledge. That's what you're doing there. Do you mean like you're saying, I understand the concept. That and demonstration of knowledge might really fall into explaining that you know that there is a bigger perspective than just the one you're taking. I mean, okay? Um, um, so then the other articulation of views. You're going to take a perspective in these exams. Take them. If you're not ready to take in a perspective in these exams, you're not ready to be ordained. Okay, so take a perspective. Support your perspective. When you say perspective, is that the same as position? Is yeah, I think it is. A, a, a position, a perspective, a, I mean like who, where, clarity. We've talked about that when we talked about who you are, you know, allowing that to come in. You're being asked to take, I mean, these are questions, that, and we're going to look at them in just a minute. You're going to be asked to take a, like, there, there are things you need to, you need to can come to a conclusion before you can answer the question. Um, so those are high-level criteria. That's what they're looking for in all of them. My understanding is those are not going to change this year at all. Um, these factors are implicit in the two levels of the scales used for the GOE. Um, and these are things that the evaluators are talking about on a regular basis. Um, so proficient. The response gives evidence of a sound perspective, understanding of the basic issues raised by the questions, and how those issues relate to the canonical area being tested. Written presentation is clear and organized with apt use of source material. So you want to use enough, enough citations, but not too many. Enough to support what you're saying, but not so that the citations take over and your thinking isn't clear. Not proficient. The response largely is erroneous, minimal, or no understanding of the essential area issues in the area being tested and does not answer the question asked. Most of the time people are not proficient based on the people I know on the 
board of examining chaplains is because they did not answer the question or they skipped significant chunks of it. Um, um, arguments that the paper offers may be flawed, ineffective, or incoherent. Writing may be unclear with little or, or inappropriate use of sources. So if you're not clear or you make a skip, that's why you want to read for those transition sentences. Because <coughs> often adding a transition sentence in can just be what make, you know, you make sure that somebody reads for you. I also think, I had this conversation with a student here at BTS recently. I graded something and they said, well, I assumed you would know what I was talking about. You're an expert in this area. These people don't know you. You are a number to them. So you can't assume that they're going to read into this paper anything. I mean, so that's why your transition sentences can help make the argument. I mean, so when you do that final edit and read, does this hold together if somebody was handed this without any context? You know, except the context that's on the paper. Okay. So that's proficient and improvision. Do you get that? Okay, now we're going to look at how they lay the rubrics out in each one for that. Um, so I have the six questions from last year. Okay. Um, you guys are going to look at question one together as a team. Um, here's a third copy of that. I actually might keep that till I have it. Okay. You guys are going to look at question two together. You've got about four minutes to look at these questions together, and then we're each going to, and I want you to focus mostly on the question and the rubric. Okay. So three of you look at question three. You guys, the two of you will look at question four. You'll look at question five, and I'm going to pass six down to you guys. Particularly, I want you to look at the question and then the rubric, um, and then be willing to share with people how you there you go. Um, share with people insight about what do you see, what are the pieces that you're going to read for, answer for. Three minutes to do that. Okay, I know you could have many more conversations, and I hope you guys will dig, dig the questions out and dig them apart. But I want to sort of just stop us and have some sharing so that we can have some conversation. Um, anybody, we don't have to go in order, but anybody willing to sort of say, hey, this is what I'm reading, this is what I saw? Any group want to jump in? Sure, jump in, guys. So the question was on Holy Scriptures. Does anyone 
we were the only ones that have it. Right, you're the only ones that have it. You so, all have it online. Sure, it's online. sure. Right, yeah. Um, and so it gives us a pastoral scenario. Uh, we're teaching a youth Bible study. A former member of a Bible study was recently killed in an act of terror. And our Bible study passage is on Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, which is the armor of God. And how can we exegete this, essentially? And um, that would be about three quarters of our response. And then the last quarter of it is how do we pastorally apply it to the scenario? So we would gather maybe a couple commentaries really quickly, read one or two of them. Well, at least more than one, because we want to get a multiple approach. Um, see if that gives us enough information, and then apply it and see what we can do. So it wants us to demonstrate critical thinking, <clears throat> which we would do in the, you know, in explicating the text with contemporary Anglican biblical interpretation, historical context, literary style, socio-cultural elements. So we would include that in our explication of the text <clears throat> and then uh, our show that we can be pastoral. Yeah. As, as, I interpret, <laughs> so, as I interpret the question, the first 800 word would not, would be more of an academic exercise and then the last uh, fifth of it, uh, uh, or, yeah, fifth of it would be, 200 words would be the pastoral application, you know. Pick. So I see that as a division. You could, you could do it, I mean, you could do it in that same way. You don't have to be so strict, too. Do you know what I mean? Like, you, you can, um, yeah, you want to do about 800 words in some of this background piece, but you could still use personal first-person voice in that. I mean, in the same way you do with preaching. It's okay to let that voice come in. But yes, I think that that's a fair way to do this. Now, I want to point out some things. I want to read you guys something out of the rubric here, okay, for proficient. Demonstrates use and application of critical thinking in relationship to the following techniques of contemporary Anglican biblical interpretation, historical context, literary style, theology, and sociocultural elements. How old... Is your Anglican resource there that you're going, to, how old, like far back in history, are you going to use in order to demonstrate contemporary Anglican biblical interpretation? So Luther's out. Probably. <laughs> Do you mean like you could use that for historical context? But read closely. They're telling you here. They want you to be, they want you to be citing an Anglican who's written something about probably since World War II, about terror. Yes. Do you know what I mean? And about crisis. Yeah. The, the question was, the rubric, this, we're given all of this. You're it's given it. all of this. This is the question. Uh, you know I mean? Like, this is what you're given. You, they, are, they're, they, are, they want you to succeed. <laughs> they're not telling you anything. And you guys, before you ever, they ever write this, they write the questions and then they trade them with teams and other teams write answers and they grade against their rubrics to make sure that their rubrics are clear enough and then they edit them again. They are in the middle of test writing all these questions right now. So it's pretty, I mean like the group that writes them and then another group responds and then that group says, does our rubric work? Do you mean so like this is where reading the rubrics important. Does adjectives used in the rubric become important? Yes. And then maybe this question isn't answerable, but like an Anglican biblical interpretation is a pretty vague um, statement. In fact, like if we say Anglican versus Episcopalian, it's drastically different. Right, and they don't care. They don't care. No. All right. Yeah, like they're in, if you, they, they, you know, you should be clear that you support it, you chose this person because, you know, as an Anglican they fit into our tradition, or as an Episcopal, you know, I specifically chose this person because I was looking for an American response to terror. And that, you know, this was a, that biblical interpretation comes from that. It's however you define it. They don't have a hidden agenda. Sure. Um, and one reason more, so if, if, if your reader deems it improficient, other readers then read it to make sure that they agree with that person. Do you know what I mean? And your bishop happens to be the chair of the board right now. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so it's not, I mean, if people, so I want, I mean, if you're getting, I will say this at this point, if you get back in an exam that was not proficient, 
I feel like there's a lot of validity to the grading. I don't have questions about the grading. In the last five years, they've worked with an educational specialist and someone who's helped them radically redo it. And like I said, their process for writing the questions and learning and testing the rubrics is so intensive that I feel like it's a pretty solid <laughs> exam right now. Mm -hmm. On this question, I know we're taking up a lot of time on this question, That's I right. apologize. But uh, the, the Anglican, um, it says the Anglican biblical interpretation. You know, the commentaries that I own probably, I hadn't gone back to check, but I don't know if any of them are, are actually written by Anglican scholars. So, you know, how much research can you do in an hour? I guess my question is, is it, is it worth going to find, in your library, find somebody? So you remember that you could also, um, you can also talk about how something can fit in with the Anglican tradition, even if someone is not Anglican, by making a connection to how they do their work. I mean, so a biblical scholar who is paying attention to both um, Bible and um, um, uh, experience. experience, do you mean Bible and experience, you could make that argument that, as, you know, as Anglicans, we don't read just within our tradition. We widely read beyond our tradition. Um, you know, Sally Smith, while not an Anglican biblical scholar, regularly speaks to and works on making connections between um, scripture, tradition, and reason, which to my, which in my end means that she speaks to my need to pastorally respond in an, within an Episcopal context. Do you mean like so? Um, that that kind of piece. You also remember, you guys, you're open source. You're open source, and so Google is your friend. I mean, to spend a few minutes thinking about, you know, response to Anglican, Anglican biblical responses to terrorism acts. Because it doesn't also say that that has to be an academic cite citation. So what did the Archbishop of Canterbury say after the London bombings? What did our presiding bishop say and publish immediately after 9-11? Jamie, like those are things that you can also pull in there. Um, historical context, that can be, you know, you can either go with theologically with that or, his, you know, historically with that. Um, literary style theology, socio-cultural elements. So, okay. Um, and then application integrates pastoral and exegetical awareness. This is where... Um, while these are two different segments, you want to make some connection between these. The 800 words and the 200 words need to read in relationship with each other. So, I mean, because they, there's an integration between them. Um, so, and concerns of the text and Bible study. So, like, you want to integrate some of your awareness up above. So, but do you see there? I mean, they're going to give you a lot. So I think outlines or notes or just a here's my checklist, what I'm going to make sure is in this answer, and then break out your time. Um, I want to look at, I'm going to look at question, we're going to look at question one because it's probably all the time we have left. Um, but you guys, you know, like, I, take the last three years and spend some time looking at some of these questions and get into a rhythm of, okay, how am I going to do this? But you see that they're really clear about... Um, about what is proficient and what's not proficient. In this question, I think that you have to, um, I would be looking for you to um, refer to the fact that you are, um, do you mean like you may determine and decide how old is this Bible study group? While they don't define that, you could define that and that could become a part of your mm -hmm. response. You can always narrow the question more. You mean like you can always define it more and say I'm doing this because I've given this context. Um, so. Killed in an act of terror. If you're writing this question for a parish in New York City, your answer is probably going to be really different than if you're writing this for a small town somewhere who had a military off, um, who, who you imagine this person to be a military person who's off serving and killed in an act of terror and your town's never known anyone who's died in a terrorism act before. Two different contexts. 
feel free to give yourself permission to, you know, to narrow that, give it a context, write to that. Okay, let's talk about Christian worship. This is, this is a complicated question. This is a question I think you can get lost in really easy. So I'm going to set it up and then you guys tell me what you've seen, okay? So your, con a congregation, your congregation has purchased a seven, an 1870s cruciform <coughs> Gothic stone church that fits more than 500 people in fixed pews. The nave crossings and transepts are all on one level, three chancel steps up to an altar. A large stone baptismal font is in the center rear. The chancel um, contains the console for a well-maintained pipe organ. It's in a neighborhood of ethnic, economic, and social transition. Your congregation Sunday attendance is 75 and financially stable. You have to work.